one of the most wearing things for most of us is summed up in a sentence that comes from the heart of most men and women today. It's a verse from a well-known old book that we were taught to respect in our childhood days. And uh, the statement runs like this, I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. And I think most of you listening today know that experience in your own life. We plan to have a beautiful evening with our wives. We plan to have a wonderful Saturday outing with the children. And then either our wife says something that offends us or the children do something that we didn't expect them to do. And before we know it, these peace-loving Gandhi-type individuals that we thought we were have turned into raving monsters that create a hideous war that ends up the day in a tragedy instead of in a delight. And I think all of us know that experience. Probably you, like me, have determined that you would be most understanding and most kind to your wife on a certain day. And yet something crops up, some letter comes through the mail, or someone says something about a certain situation that you were not prepared to receive. And before you know it, you've either lost your temper or all your good resolutions have gone to the wind and you end up making the person that you say you love miserable. That's what we have termed the Jekyll and Hyde syndrome. And that's what we've been talking about really the past two weeks or so on this program. The title of the program is, What is the Meaning of Life? And we've been looking at some of the phenomena of life itself that might help to give us an understanding of the meaning of life and its purpose and why we're all here. And what we have been sharing is the various experiences that all of us have in this Jekyll and Hyde syndrome. You remember Jekyll and Hyde was the novel that was written by Robert Louis Stevenson about the respectable Dr. Jekyll, who in the evenings turned into a hideous monster called Hyde, who was guilty of all kinds of violent and hateful actions. And that's why we call it the Jekyll and Hyde syndrome, because most of us seem to have an experience of a hideous monster inside, a monster that seems to be filled with selfishness and filled with a desire for its own way, and that contrasts with the civilized veneer that we wear on the outside. Now, the problem with most of us is that we really don't believe that that hideous monster is the real us nor, of course, can we say that the real us is the civilized, respectable side that we would like to think is us. But we suspect that the true us lies somewhere between these two personalities. And, of course, our constant aim in this life is to make the good overcome the evil. And that's what we're hoping all the time to do. And that's what we spend our whole lives doing, right? From we were children, from our teachers encouraged us to be self-disciplined and to be self-contained and self-controlled, right up through the time when our parents encouraged us to be loving and to be understanding, right up through the time when our college professors encouraged us to uh, let the classic virtues of uh, self-control and of truthfulness and honesty predominate right up through the present experience that we have in our particular careers or our trades where our employers or our employees encourage us to be upstanding and to be kindly and generous in our dealings with them. And yet all of us face the impossibility of getting the good to predominate. Now, part of the problem is we don't really face the fact that this monstrosity inside us is us. That's part of our problem. And we don't realize or accept that partly because we don't know how to get rid of it. And we feel if we admit it's there, then we're faced with an impossible defeat for the rest of our lives. 
And so most of us spend our days walking around this monstrosity of self or reading books on how to control your temperament or how to think positively or how to be a better person. And we feel all the time that we're trying to tame a roaring, hideous, evil lion with uh, a piece of uh, candy. We feel we're trying to tame something that actually cannot be tamed. And, of course, most of us have had that experience. We've encouraged our good side a little and tried to discourage our bad side, and we think we're beginning to get on top of it when suddenly the bad side breaks out into another hideous display of temper that blows our whole family life and domestic life apart or that creates in us that desire to be the ugliest, most lustful creatures we could ever imagine. And so we feel at times we're just beginning to overcome the evil in us and suddenly it breaks out again seemingly worse than before. And that's one of the incredible and ironic and impossible uh, signs of this old self within us. That is, it seems to get stronger the more years we pass in this world. It seems to get stronger and more subtle. It doesn't seem to get weaker. Indeed, what seems to get weaker is, as in the case of Jekyll and Hyde, the Dr. Jekyll seems to get weaker. The respectable, civilized, moral side of us seems to get weaker and get more worn out as the years go by. Part of the problem, therefore, that most of us face in this life, indeed, is probably the biggest problem that we face, is how to get rid of this evil side or how to make the good side predominate. This problem becomes acute in a situation like uh, alcoholism or drug addiction or homosexuality or lesbianism or really the other things that are equally as great, uh, constant dishonesty, constant boastfulness, uh, a tendency to lie or to veil the truth or to speak half-truths, a tendency to criticize or be sarcastic with other people. These particular vices are what destroy not only our own lives but the lives of those with whom we live or with whom we work. So that phenomenon is a very real one that probably you know intimately yourself. And what we have been talking about is the origin of that phenomenon and why it seems so impossible for us to overcome it or to tame it in any way. And you remember what we have said is it ties up directly with the two ways that we have for living life here in this world. We can either live it as if there is no creator, as if there is no originator, behind the sky and the clouds, the wood, the steel, the, the automobiles, the air, the wind, the ocean, the rivers. We can live as if there's no originator behind all those things, as if there is no personal creator, as if those things came about by some wild chance of time plus an evolutionary process that had no direction in it. We can either live that way, believe that, and live that way, in which case we're left pretty much on our own. Or we can live as if there is an originator, as if there is a personal creator behind all this, and as if he is actually the one that lies behind our life, and as if it's him and his friendship that we really need. And so we can live one way or the other. We can either live as if there is a creator, or we can live as if there isn't a creator. If we live as if there isn't a creator, of course we're in pretty tight straits. Because there are 5 billion of us now in this universe, 4 billion, 4 billion at the moment. There'll be 10 billion in the, about the year 2030. But there are about 4 billion of us now on this planet. And every one of us thinks we're important and thinks we're unique. And yet none of the rest seem to believe that. And so all of us are trying to get everybody else's attention to see how unique we are. That creates an awful lot of egos to be satisfied. And of course that drives us to jealousy. It drives us to pride. It drives us to ambition.
It's the same with the material possessions that are available in this world. Four billion of us are striving to get enough of them to keep body and soul together. That means an awful lot of people trying to get an awful lot from whatever possessions are here in the world. That means a great deal of greed, a great deal of covetousness, a great deal of grabbing what we want, whatever it costs anybody else. That produces the tremendous, monstrous, selfish drive within us that we talk about as the Mr. Hyde. There is, of course, the remains of the Dr. Jekyll in us, because actually there is a creator. It just makes sense. There has to be a creator to create the order that we see around us and the personality that we all have. And there is in us a similar drive towards trusting in that creator. That's briefly the explanation of where these two sides of our nature come from. Let's talk tomorrow a little more about them and how to be delivered from one into the other.